With the dawning of the day, which brought the first of September, came our entrance and initiation into the normal school life and ways. Not thinking it best to let this blue day slip useless away, although it seemed as if it would at first, until presented with an innumerable amount of material, we made our debut into normal school. Normalities, class of 1910. It's a home that you can always return to. That's how I feel about WestCon. It's been a source of happiness for me. It was able to allow me to use my abilities, uh, whatever abilities I had, and skills I've had, and talents I've had. I really got, at little expense, a good education. WestCon gave me the chance to succeed, personally and professionally. And I can't overlook that. In 1890, faced with the overwhelming influx of immigrants and increased birth rates, the Connecticut State Legislature realized the need for more teachers. They approved the establishment of two additional normal schools, one in New Haven, the other in Bridgeport. New Haven built theirs, Bridgeport did not. Danbury was a dark horse, no one had thought about them being the site for it, but the community organized so that in the spring, June 1903, Danbury was named the site of the fourth, and it turns out to be the last, of the normal schools. The city of Danbury had permission, but needed a location. In stepped Alexander White, a native philanthropist and businessman who donated three acres of his family farm for the site of the Danbury Normal School. It's near the center of town, near the railroad station, and at that point, most of the students would be commuting here, um, and some room for expansion, and it seemed like the perfect solution. Work on the new normal school building has actually been commenced. The building will be located on the east side of the knoll on the well-known white property and on the slope of the lot. This location is such that there will be very little excavation needed before the actual building may be commenced. Danbury News, March 1904. The normal school was a two-year course. Uh, the first year was more classes so that people could commute a little easier. Uh, but the second year they had to do practice teaching in Baum Fourth Avenue or Locust Avenue School or one of the, the rural schoolhouses. And we stayed out six weeks. And then we come back and have classes. Everyone had to go to the country school sometime during their three years. It was uh, from first grade to eighth grade. One teacher. After leading the struggle in the legislature to name Danbury as the site for the final normal school, John Perkins was named principal. Perkins is an interesting guy. He's a Dartmouth graduate, went into education, taught at schools in New England, um, taught at the gunnery here in, in Washington, which is where he met his wife, and then took a little bit of a detour in his career. He went to the Hartford Theological Seminary, and I think that's kind of important too, because he saw teaching very much as a kind of a missionary effort. Perkins' job was to get the place going namely to keep the commuters on time and to find places for people to live. He felt in order to make this a, a, a much better school, we needed a boarding facility. Besides, he was unhappy that these women would either go home to Newtown or Ridgefield by train at the end of the school day, or they'd go off to where they lived, uh, and they didn't have any experience of having a college environment. In the early 1920s, Perkins began pressuring the Board of Education for the funding to build a residence hall. In 1923, Perkins saw his dream crumble as the governor vetoed the legislature's approval to build the residence hall. He died later that year. The people from Danbury, the business leaders, the professional people, ordinary citizens, really started twisting the arms of the legislature. 
In 1925, the legislature appropriated funds to build Fairfield Hall. It opened two years later. It changes the nature of the school. We're not just a, like a high school, a, a commuting place. We're now a boarding facility, but also the role of the community in supporting the school is, is very strong and is shown here. Lothrop Higgins was John Perkins' right-hand man. Also a New England Yankee, educated at Brown, he was the first male teacher hired in Danbury. And he had to come through uh, Sugar Hollow, so he would uh, t pick up different specimens on the way. And one day, uh, he apparently picked up this twig, and it had cat dent caterpillars in. I sat in the front seat in his class, and I sat there and I looked and looked. Here's this little bug crawling, crawling. Was almost going into his collar. I jumped up and took it off. <laughs> there were other people who saw it, but they didn't say a word. <laughs> they said, "How could you do it?" <laughs> didn't make any difference to me. He had these science kits, which were packaged kits with chemicals and equipment in it that could be taken out to these rural schools where they didn't have laboratories uh, because that's where our, our focus is. He was small, thin, very solemn, and formal. His office in Old Main was precise. Furniture had to be in certain spots. It was rumored that he put thumbtacks on the floor to keep it exactly positioned. He was big for promoting school groups and student government and everything, but he would constantly lecture them about behavior and honesty and so forth. He was, in fact, uh, urged the student council to be kind of uh, um, investigators of student behavior and report to him what was going on. So it was really kind of a harsh atmosphere. He was principal during the Depression, and like the rest of the country, Connecticut fell on hard times. Class size fluctuated greatly, rarely exceeding 100 students. Due to the lack of teaching jobs, the state increased the normal school program from two to three years. So it's in the late 1930s that it looked so bleak there for a while that we might not even exist. We end up being a four-year school uh, and not a normal school any longer, a teacher's college. When Lothrop Higgins died, the college searched outside for a new president. Ralph Jenkins was the exact opposite of his predecessor. He was a big, burly Dartmouth grad who dressed in tailored suits, chomped on cigars, and didn't mind taking a drink. Jenkins' first order of business was to bring in men. He felt that teachers' salaries would not increase until men entered the profession. So men began to come in in classes in 37, 38, 39. We began to get a pretty sizable group of men for the first time. So the school took on a little bit different coloration because of that. We were kind of an innocent, I think, a very innocent uh, time for us. We didn't compete. It didn't seem to be we were trying to outdo anyone. If someone was having trouble in our class or classmate, you would stop and help them. This much at least can be said for the Teachers College Forum in the Green Thursday evening. The people of Danbury, who had dined well, put on their thinking caps and the headgear seemed to become them. A goodly number of townsfolk showed their appreciation of one of the real contributions to community welfare which the Teachers College has been making through its forum for 14 successive years. Danbury News, February 1942. Then the war comes along and the school shrinks again. When we entered, I think we had 72 in the class and at graduation we only had 58, but uh, several of those were men who had enlisted mm -hmm. because Pearl Harbor happened mm -hmm. in our senior year. When the war was ending, Jenkins was looking toward the future and warned the state that the community wanted more than a teacher's college. They wanted a people's college. They wanted a school that would serve all of the people in the region. She was born in upstate New York the same year the Danbury Normal School opened. Educated at Syracuse University, her goal was to become a college professor in a time when few women occupied the profession. 
In 1931, at the age of 28, Ruth Haas came to Danbury. She was the right person for this job. Um, and she was vivacious and energetic and an athlete. And uh, she used to, students would remember, her, you know, that she used to go with them under the tunnel that runs between Fairfield Hall and Old Main, go over to play basketball at night. And um, so she came here in 1931 as the uh, dean of women, uh, kind of the, the house mother for this place. We loved Miss Haas. She had only been here one year ahead of us, so she was like one of, the, one of us. We loved her. Hmm. As the college grew in the late 30s, Ralph Jenkins knew that he needed help. One of the things that he wanted to do was, he said, I can't do everything at this place. It's getting bigger, all right? A little bigger. Um, I need an academic dean. But I don't have to go very far to find one. Uh, Ruth Haas seems to have the confidence of all of the students, so I'm going to make her academic dean as well as dean of women. Dr. Haas was much more accessible. You could go to her with any, any problem you might have. She was a very personable person, but dignified at the same time. Uh, you would never dare call her by her first name. That would be unheard of. But uh, you felt comfortable being in her presence. Dr. Haas was a very, very warm person. She had a remarkable memory. Uh, I don't know how she could remember names, but not only our names, she could remember the names of my children, the names of relatives. She knew about your progress. She knew how you were doing. Um, years later, uh, every time I got a promotion, I'd get a note from her. When my first wife uh, died of cancer, uh, she was there at the uh, wake. I hadn't seen her in a long time. But she remembered us all. After Jenkins died in the fall of 1947, the Board of Education didn't need to look very far to find his successor. Ruth Haas was appointed president. Dr. Haas takes over a school in the midst of great change as the population of Connecticut drastically increases and more and more people become interested in teaching. The 50s in some ways are really the golden years of this place because we're, we're big enough, but we're not too big. We have a younger faculty, we had to increase the faculty a little bit, uh, newcomers coming here who are very eager and energetic, a young president who wants to leave her mark on the place. Um, and she has very committed to teaching. Um, so in the 50s, we go through a lot of educational experiments. Every spring, the faculty and students would come together in an effort to improve the campus. It was called Due Day. It, it gave the students a chance to work with teachers on a, a more equal footing. Uh, the teachers would wear dungarees. Uh, you never saw a professor without a necktie and a suit in those days, but uh, it's an interesting experience to be uh, raking leaves with uh, your teacher. It didn't last beyond the 50s. The school got too big, um, and as they got bigger, you know, departments were organized, and um, more conventional ways of doing things. But for the 50s, when the school was that size, I mean, there was a real exciting tone here, educationally. Uh, and alumni still remember that. The college was also growing physically because Dr. Haas was building buildings. Higgins Hall was built in 1950, followed shortly after by Berkshire Hall and a new student union. The name of the place changed a lot, and it changed during this period because the kind of school that we were was a, a different school. We weren't just a teacher's college now. We had a four-year program, and we had liberal arts courses, too, and we had other majors during the 1950s. So, in 1959, the presidents of the four state colleges were given permission to drop the word teachers from the name. The 60s were a very prosperous time in the Danbury area. Increased birth rates and suburban sprawl led the enrollment of the college to balloon to never-before-seen numbers. It, it had a lot of impact. I mean, it had a lot of impact on the kind of place that we were. Ruth Haas lamented, and she told a, a reporter from The Echo, the more that come, the fewer I know. 
When I came to West Con in 60, it was fairly quiet. The 60s revolution hadn't hit yet. It was really the end of the 50s rather than the beginning of the 60s. By the time I left in 64, it was the beginning of the 60s revolution in the country. It was a very difficult time. It was uh, the whole Vietnam era. Uh, there was a lot of division on campus. Um, there were almost daily arguments and discussions and meetings and sit-ins and uh, people organizing for different groups and student nonviolent coordinating committee and you know it was the whole combination military 60s hippie um, period. More and more students were protesting uh, participating in a march from campus down to Rogers Park and back a candlelight protest. There was an uh, effort to uh, boycott classes, there was a teach, many teach-ins and so forth. One of the first days I was at Westcon, I got there, um, got up in the classroom and Herb Janik started the class and uh, almost immediately a student from the back of the room started challenging him and it grew into a confrontation and Herb ended up kicking the guy out and the guy threatened him on the way out. So uh, as soon as he left the room, you know, Herb took like three seconds and then he said, okay, I want everybody to write down what you just saw. The one good thing about it was that everybody pretty much had an opinion and, and you know, it wasn't a blasé, I don't care kind of thing. It was pretty intense. In 1967, after the reorganization with our own board of trustees, um, they eliminated the Danbury name and made it Western Connecticut to emphasize the more regional nature of the school. With the prosperity of the surrounding area and the increased size of the student body, the school began to outgrow its 35-acre campus. The state began questioning whether Danbury was the right place for a college. If you think about us physically, we're an island here where we are now. It was interesting that at one time that there was talk of swapping Fairfield Hills Hospital grounds in Newtown with uh, Westcon because uh, they had a lot of building and they, they weren't getting, they had empty buildings and they had you know, hundreds of acres. But that never, that was in the papers a couple days and then it sort of died out. There wasn't any interest on either part, I think, to do it. John Previty, a former mayor of Danbury, stepped forward and offered to sell the state a piece of property he owned on Mill Plain Road. He had bought the property as an investment for his daughters, but was willing to part with it if it kept the college in Danbury and the legislature appropriates the money to buy the piece of property and we're saved. And suddenly we have two campuses. Nobody ever planned for that. Nobody ever said, wouldn't it be great if we had two campuses? It's strictly a defensive move to make sure they don't get rid of this place. And it's the community really did it. Uh, I mean, Dr. Haas marshaled this and she had great respect in the legislature because she was such a lady. The initial idea was to move the entire college to the new suburban property. Plans were drawn of a new modern 10 building campus. So all through the 1970s, nothing happened on the west side. The 70s was a terrible time on this campus physically. No repairs, no maintenance, no money. Anybody who tried to park in the pit, the pit was the parking area on the other side of White Street where the uh, parking garage is now. Um, you took your, your life in your hands, your car sunk up to your fenders in mud. And every year we had to have a tow trucks come in and pull the student cars out that were stuck in the mud, literally. Uh, I mean, it, it, that's typical of what was going on on the campus. It was a very good school. The 70s was a dynamic time in the school, I think. Without any money for the new campus, the Mill Plain property stood empty. Dr. Haas continued to push the legislature to get something built. Finally, they conceded and approved funds to build a road for the new campus. A road to nowhere. Well, that was Dr. Haas's swan song. She said, I'm never going to get a building. I'm never going to get a campus. I'm going to retire. So she retired in 1975. I think a little disillusioned that not more came of, of this. Following Ruth Haas's retirement, 
the state undertook its most extensive presidential search to date. In stepped a young, laid-back Californian who had experience dealing with community groups and state legislatures. His name was Robert Bercy. He came to Danbury in the fall of 1975 and knew exactly what he had to do. He had to develop the West Side Campus. When I first got here, we had uh, envisioned building a new campus on the West Side Campus with 10 buildings. We had almost $60 million put aside that the state was holding for us. And we had plans for the buildings already drawn. Then the economy went bad. And uh, Governor Grasso at the time notified Dr. Bercy, who was president at the time, that we were in danger of losing the whole West Side Campus. He had the students stage a mock funeral on the West Side Campus. They mobilized here. They had hearses. They had a, uh, a coffin. They had pallbearers. This was the, the death of higher education in Danbury. And they, had, they watched through town up to the West Side Campus to dramatize, hopefully, and get a lot of press to put some pressure on the legislature to let us keep the campus. And finally, the state agreed to build one building, the classroom building. And again, he was aggressive and ambitious, and he wanted to uh, do that. Um, but he had to, you know, settle for what we settled for. Um, I don't think there was any other choice he had other than to take the chance of losing the campus. He got private money. He got Nate Ansell, the CEO at Ethan Allen, to give $600,000 to the school. He saw that Western was on the verge of growing to something quite bigger, and I think he was the right guy to kind of make that transition. Bercy believed that if he laid out a plan for a major university, the state would take notice. He planned for three schools, arts and sciences, professional studies, and the Ansel School of Business, led by an outsider named Stephen Feldman. When Robert Bercy left to head a campus of the University of Nevada system in 1982, the Board of Trustees named Stephen Feldman to be president. In 1983, during Feldman's tenure, Western Connecticut State College became a university. Using the endless connections to the business community he cultivated as Dean of the Business School, while working tirelessly to lobby state politicians about the importance of Western, Feldman was able to secure funds to continue the university's growth. Stephen Feldman was, I think, an unbelievable contributor to the success that Westcon has now. He made a concerted effort to place a new focus on athletics. He built athletics into something important. He did build the field house, took him 10 years to get the money for the field house. Under his leadership, the Ansel School of Business would become one of the leading centers of business education in the area. In 1992, Dr. James Roach was appointed the seventh president of Westcon. Previously, he had been the academic dean at North Adams State and was the president of the University of Maine at Presque Isle. A committed academic, he stressed the importance of lifelong learning and implemented new terminal and doctoral level degree programs at the university. Roach also believed in the important role the environment plays in education. I think President Roach's primary contribution to the school has been that he very early, and, and he did this when he was in Maine too, he very early identified that what was needed was an environment that was upbeat rather than one that would uh, ground people down. And he knew that he had to do something with the Midtown campus. Not just building buildings, the addition to Berkshire, the addition to the student union, the buying of University Hall and opening that up to students while the student union was under construction, uh, the library, uh, Warner Hall, um, all of the buildings that he built on this campus, but also landscaping of the campus. You know, cynics were saying, you know, well, this is really hokey, campus pride, you know, what, what does that mean? But he was right that the landscaping and the walkways and the lights and things did boost people's spirits and made for a, a, a different atmosphere on campus. And I think that was very important. Oh, President Roche has done so much in the short time he's been here. 
uh, the, the look of the school. It's warm, it's embracing, it's friendly. Um, it, everything is easily accessible with all these wonderful little paths. I remember things changing on campus rapidly, like uh, the buildings, you know. There was a lot of growth. It was a little, you know, hairy getting around during that formative time, but it's beautiful now. Mm -hmm. It's a much prettier campus, a nicer campus to be on, uh, more modern, but its basic purpose, I think, is unchanged. There's no substitute for, for the undergraduate experience that uh, we enjoyed at Westcon. And I think something about the size of the school, the relationship that students had with their instructors uh, and could have with each other. You weren't in a lecture hall with 500 other students. You were a real person with a real name. I think the biggest change for me from my freshman and my senior year was the feeling of confidence that I got in my ability. And that was something that was totally enhanced by my professors. They made me feel like I could do it. I think WestCon plays a vital role in the community, as do all public universities, uh, community colleges, and public school systems in this country, because it's the public schools from K through higher education that really provide the opportunity for people to get the skills, the knowledge, the culture that they need to then succeed in American life. We're here to provide an opportunity for higher education to people who don't have a lot of other options. Whether it's money, whether it's family responsibilities, uh, whatever it is, this provides an opportunity for people who can't go somewhere else. And people over the hundred years have seized that opportunity and have done great things with it. It was a wonderful experience.